when you go to Frank's office, as long as he has been at the Pentagon, there is a sign that talks about data right next to the front door uh, that says, in God we trust, all others bring data, which is uh, not your invention, Frank. I think that's a quote from uh, Edward Deming, but nonetheless, a very apt quote for your approach to the world and one that uh, we here at CSIS greatly appreciate. I do want to mention that in addition to authoring the articles and the, and, and the other items that are part of this book, uh, you authored four reports uh, on the performance of the defense acquisition system. Uh, you have been committed to actually measuring the outcomes uh, in the acquisition system and making sure that others do so uh, and being upfront with people about uh, successes, about uh, failures, and about uh, what the sources of both are and how to, as you say, get defense acquisition right. Uh, also, uh, together with uh, Dr. Carter, the author of three versions of Better Buying Power, um, and uh, I think it would be hard, although many of the people in this room know, it would be hard to express in anyone who didn't participate just how much work went into each iteration of better buying power, not only in the formulation, but then in the execution uh, of those. Uh, Frank has served six years as either the acting or the, uh, almost six, I'm gonna give you six, as either the acting or the confirmed uh, Undersecretary of Defense for Acquisition, um, which, and I, I meant to do the homework on this, I didn't quite get to it, but I think is the longest tenure of anyone uh, in that job or of any of its predecessor uh, jobs. Uh, under his leadership, uh, Major uh, acquisition programs uh, have been initiated to uh, procure a new bomber for the Air Force, a new missile submarine for the Navy, uh, upgraded artillery for the Army, and, and a whole slew of other systems across uh, the arsenal. And most important, and uh, I'm not gonna directly identify him, although I think he's here today, but there was uh, someone in my Twitter feed who tweeted out that the thing that they will miss most about having you in the job uh, is your integrity, and I want to wholeheartedly endorse that comment. And without further ado, I want to introduce Frank Kendall. Well, thanks for coming this afternoon. Uh, I, I appreciate the standing room-only crowd. Um, it's uh, somebody who's only got 48 hours left at office, right? And, uh, we're about to have an inauguration, and uh, I think you'd much rather hear from people coming in than the people going out. But I, uh, I want to take this opportunity, and I thank you, Andrew, and CSIS for hosting today, uh, to, to talk about something that I put together uh, and in publishing. It, it has some interesting virtues. For one thing, it's free. <laughs> um, it, it's a government uh, publication. It's not a, a private publication at all. And the volume that I'm going to talk about is a compendium mostly of articles that I've been writing for the last five years. For the ATNL workforce, the acquisition workforce in the department. And they were written for the workforce, uh, but they apply to uh, our, our field of endeavor in general. And they, they cover a lot of things that are about fundamentals of acquisition, about very specific topics in acquisition, about the political climate that we've been living in off and on for the last several years. So it's a pretty broad spectrum of things. And what happened was about six months ago, give or take, uh, it occurred to me that it might be worthwhile to kind of pull all these things together in one place and organize them in a way which was sort of logical. And that if I did that, it might be something worth putting into a volume. So with the help of the Defense Acquisition University, um, I did that. I organized all these different articles. And as I was doing that, I concluded that there were some other things that I had written uh, over the course of the last several years that should be included as well to tell a complete story. So we added some things, a few emails, for example, a letter that I recently sent to the service chiefs um, about my views on their role in acquisition, largely, and a, and a few other things. So that's what this is. It is, at the same time, a topical coverage of various areas of acquisition. Uh, it is not in chronological order, but it is the story of the things that have happened over the last several years. Um, and, and hopefully it contains some wisdom and some knowledge that I've gained over my 40 odd years of working in some facet or act of defense acquisition, technology and logistics. And I hope it'll be useful to people outside the department and having it in one place, Defense Acquisition University will, I believe, use it uh, as, a, as a text. Uh, I don't know if they're gonna have me come back and teach a course out of it, but they haven't asked me and I hadn't even thought about that till this moment, but who knows. Um, but in any event, I think it might be useful for people to um, 
uh, and you can to, to kind of appreciate more of the reality of defense acquisition. In this town, we, we talk about defense acquisition all the time. And there are a lot of people who will give talks and write papers and so on who haven't lived it. And I don't think if you, if you I think if you have not lived it, you don't really appreciate what the real day-to-day -day problems are that our managers have to confront. Uh, and buried in this body of work is a, a good deal of discussion of that. In, in fact, included in here are excerpts from some of the reports that I get annually from both program managers and program executive officers. And they tell the story of the, the, the difficulties of working things through, dealing with industry in some cases, dealing with all the regulations that we have to confront and, and comply with and so on. So that's basically what uh, this body of work is. I organized it in what I thought was a logical order with logical groupings of topics. And then I wrote some material to stitch it all together and then added some of the additional items uh, from the last few years that I thought were relevant and germane. So this chart uh, gives you the structure. Uh, the first chapter is about policy. And it talks about getting acquisition policy overall right. It starts with the idea that you know, we should set reasonable requirements. Uh, we should put professionals in charge of doing acquisition. We should give them the resources that they need. Uh, and we should provide strong incentives for success. And that's pretty much all the acquisition policy that I think you really need. Uh, there's a world of difficulty in doing all that, and it gets much more complicated after that when you throw a lot of other things into the mix. So in that section, uh, I talk about a number of things related to policy, and then I move on to what is really, I think, the most important thing in acquisition success, which is professionalism and people. And this is a recurring theme through a lot of these articles. And basically there I talk about uh, some of the things that I expect of our professionals and why I believe that their professionalism is the key to success or the key to improvement. I will tell you up front that I am not a believer in acquisition magic. I don't think that there is some wonderful undiscovered way to do this, that if we could just figure it out, everything would be much better. Uh, I think it's all about hard work, attention to detail, and really knowing what you're doing. And at the end of the day, it's about incremental improvements on a lot of different fronts as opposed to anything dramatic. So I, I then turn to one of my favorite subjects, which is managing technical complexity. And we have a number of articles that come at that from different perspectives. Uh, the, the challenge of defense acquisition is, generally speaking, to do something that has never been done before, uh, to do it uh, as, uh, to a schedule and to a budget that you've set, uh, to achieve the performance you've set out to do, and to have, uh, as a result of that process, the creation of a new weapon system that is a generation ahead of anything anybody else has in the world. Now, the expectation in, in this town is often that you're going to do that perfectly. That's an unrealistic expectation, actually. And I think it leads to a lot of problems. But that's the job. That's the job, managing the development of new technology and putting it into a product that's useful to the warfighter. And a great deal of complexity comes with that. Uh, and managing that complexity and getting that all right is, is the heart of what we have to do to bring new weapon systems into existence. Next section deals with industry. It talks about our relationship to industry, uh, which at its time is called a partnership, but it's, it's defined by the contracts we write with industry and it's defined by how we actually conduct that relationship uh, together. And what I have tried to do over my tenure, which I think is the right approach, is to have a very business-like approach. Uh, it should be cordial, it doesn't have to be confrontational, but it should be done with an understanding of each other's interest and done with the idea of getting to win-win results that give a reasonable profit to industry a good chance of uh, a better than reasonable profit, maybe in some cases, if they perform well. Uh, we, we need defense industry to be successful in the Defense Department. And to be successful, you have to make a profit. So it's not about squeezing industry unrealistically. It's about having reasonable expectations and setting good incentives in place to get the performance that you want, and then holding industry to the, to the, the performance that they've agreed to provide. Um, then I talk about external forces. And there's kind of a variety of uh, external forces here. Uh, one of the external forces that we dealt with over the last several years is something called sequestration, which was a very debilitating uh, event. And I talked a little bit in here, and there's some things I did in the heat of the moment, if you will, when we implemented sequestration in 2013. But I also talk about the Hill and its various attempts to regulate acquisition or to try to reform acquisition through steps that it takes through legislation. The Hill has a very imperfect tool to try to improve uh, acquisition results. It's a blunt instrument. It can do things like organizational structures. It can set uh, very firm requirements in some cases for how we do business. Uh, it, it is not a good instrument to achieve the result uh, that I think the Hill is after, but they keep trying. 
And I, to be honest, I believe that as often as not, what they do doesn't help. In some cases, it's, it's, it has the opposite effect. Uh, what it does do, almost inevitably, is create more bureaucracy and create more regulation. Because everything that gets put in a statute, we have to implement to demonstrate compliance. And so that adds and adds and adds and adds to the body of regulation that is a burden to our uh, acquisition system, frankly. I don't think it is a fundamental determiner of results. I think it's an overhead cost that we have to pay. Uh, but it's growing over time, and it would be a great thing to do to, to reduce that instead of increasing it. And I talk about customers, uh, the warfighters. I talk about their role, uh, particularly in the requirements process, and doing trade-offs as we go through the acquisition process, as we become more knowledgeable, uh, as designs firm up, and as we have to make decisions about cost and performance and so on, their role in that, as well as the, the intelligence community's role in acquisition. So a number of stakeholders there. Um, <clears throat> and then I talk about measuring progress. What Andrew mentioned in my sign on, uh, in God we trust, all others must bring data. I have tried to create data that reflects our progress and measures our progress, that compares institutions to one another, whether they're industry institutions or uh, different parts of the Department of Defense or different uh, acquisition executives, so that we can try to understand what works and what doesn't. Uh, the data is incredibly noisy, as you would expect, because a lot of factors affect uh, any given program's outcomes. But I think from that, we've been able to learn quite a bit. And for four years now, we've been publishing uh, the results of this work. It's a body of work that's been growing over time. We continue to do new analysis. And bottom line is that I think if you look back, it's pretty clear that we made some significant progress. I was delighted recently, uh, I'm going to pat myself on the back a little bit here, but uh, Secretary Carter, Deputy Secretary of Work, and I were named as the person of the year collectively, so I'm a third of a person of a year, um, by Aviation Week and Space Technology. <laughs> And what delighted me was not that selection, although I, I, I'm not complaining about it. What delighted me was that they published the data, that they somebody finally published some of the data that shows significant improvement in, in uh, performance on our major programs, that cost overruns are coming down significantly, and they have been for the last several years. Uh, that's an important outcome, and we should not ignore that as we think about acquisition reform. I think. You know, my, my, one of my fundamental instructions in tactics at West Point years ago uh, was the idea that you should reinforce success and not failure. So if you're doing an attack and you have part of your attack which has been stalled and that commander is asking for reinforcements so he can continue, another part of the attack is succeeding. The part of the attack you reinforce is the part that's succeeding, not the part that's failing. And so I, I feel that given the results we've achieved, we should be reinforcing the things we're doing, not trying to take a fundamentally different direction. But I'm going to be out of office in two days, and somebody else will have to decide what they want to do about that. But at least we have the data now, and we have the results to show that. OK, I'm, I'm going to say a little bit more. I'm not going to go into a great, great deal of detail about these, uh, about the contents. Uh, each section, each, each chapter has a, uh, a handful of articles, three or four, as well as perhaps some other material. Uh, I have some articles in the first one that talk about policy. I have the Better Buying Power Principles. Andrew mentioned that. Secretary Carter and I did the first version of uh, Better Buying Power in 2010 when he was the undersecretary and I was principal deputy. I did the second version about two years later, uh, and then the, th and the third of it went about two years after that. I had an uh, idea of a fourth one, uh, which was about sustainment. And Alan, I'm sorry, we didn't get there. Yeah, maybe next time. Yeah, we'll come back and do it next time. Uh, uh, but I think there is still room for improvement in, in all areas of acquisition. Uh, but the, I wanted to turn my attention to the sustainment phase because so much money is spent in sustainment compared to uh, R&D or, or production. But basically, uh, it's an observation that many have made that the better buying power principles are pretty much common sense and straightforward. They are. Uh, I was talking to a writer the other day who was doing uh, a piece on this, and I said, well, what we accomplished with those is we let everybody know that the leadership wants them to do the right thing. So that's one thing, that we understand what the right thing is. And we counter some of the negative incentives we have in our system to do things like get the money out the door, you know, the execution rate thing that people are burdened with. And we let people know uh, that we want them to do the right thing. And we also let them know that we're going to be checking on that. And examples of that include should cost, for example, which we started with Better Buying Power 1.0. And I'm in the process right now. I've, I'm, I'm coming down to the wire on this. But I, I ask every one of our program managers for our major programs, about 150 of them, and every one of our program executive officers, or about 50 of them, to send me an annual assessment of how they're doing on their program or in their portfolio. 
And in the reaction, in response to them, uh, as often as not, I'm asking about should cost. What do you got for targets for cost reduction that you're pursuing? How are you doing on that? And many of them will put it out and uh, volunteer it. I still get a few who say, I'm all fine, I'm under my budget, I'm within my budget. That's not the definition of success. The definition of success is have you found ways to reduce cost, uh, set targets for yourself, and are you doing something to do that? Uh, and I think if there's any one thing we've done in terms of cultural change, in terms of uh, a consistent set of policies that affects outcomes, that's it. Uh, and it goes all the way back to 1.0. Ash and I did it together, and we've continued to enforce that all the way since. Uh, we talk about that. I, I have an article in here from David Packer. It's, uh, the, it's Packard's Principles of Defense Acquisition. It's about 10 of them. I have posters in the, in the room in the Pentagon where the Defense Acquisition Board meets, which had Packard's Principles. They're from 1971. That was the year I graduated from West Point, so I'm dating myself. Nothing has changed, okay? New product development is new product development. And the thing is that even though the tools are all different, the designs are more complicated, a lot of things have changed on the technical side of the house, but in terms of the things you need to do to have success, they're still basically the same. Our problem is that we don't always do them for a variety of incentives that work, work against us doing them. Um, I do talk about the important aspects of better buying power that I think are uh, we need to keep our minds uh, focused on no matter what the external circumstances are. I did this during the sequestration period. Uh, affordability caps, which have been in place again since Better Buying Power 1.0, and which are being effective at getting requirements people to moderate their, their desires, to constrain their desires by what they can actually afford in their budgets, which is a, a new thing. I'm also getting requirements people to define value so that we can tell industry how much we're willing to pay for enhanced performance, and industry can bid accordingly. Uh, those are things that are, that are fundamental. Should cost is another thing that's fundamental. Competitive environments is fundamental. Uh, things that we should keep our minds on as we work through this, no matter what the budgetary situation is, what's going on out there. And then I close with uh, one that's a lead into the next section, which is about how uh, acquisition improvement is going to have to come from within. It is not going to be engineered by Hill staffers writing laws for us. It is going to be done by people in the, in the trenches every day, dealing with industry, uh, trying to get the incentives right, trying to get the performance right, trying to set up business deals and enforce them, set reasonable requirements in our contracts, do all the hundreds of things that are necessary to get good results. That's where we're going to improve. It's those day-to-day, hands-on things that are thousands of people are doing every day, which leads me to the next section, which is about professionalism. And I have, I have emphasized throughout my tenure the acquisition chain of command, uh, which runs currently through the acquisition executive, through myself to the service acquisition executive or component acquisition executive, and then down to the program executive officer and then to program manager. It's a relatively abbreviated one. It was set up by Goldwater Nichols. We have in the department drifted away from this a little bit, but that is still the basic structure. And it's that chain of command that I hold responsible for acquisition results. I start this section, the second section, by talking about what it means to be an acquisition professional. And I talk about things like integrity. I talk about things like uh, a, a, a strong set of ethics that you apply in your business dealings and in your interactions within the government with your superiors and with your subordinates. I, I talk about the skill set that you have to bring to the table to be effective. I have seen a lot of cases, and I've seen this in industry as well, where someone with a, an MBA but no technical background will be put in charge of managing a, a new product development program. It does not work very well. You need to have expertise in the thing that you're doing or you're not going to do well. Uh, and, and we've worked very, very hard over the last few years to develop the acquisition workforce and the stress in particular for our more risky programs, the right kinds of technical ba uh, background to have success there. Uh, I've done a lot to reward people for that. Um, I, I have a set of examples of program manager's assessment. There's an article which basically plagiarizes or extracts from a number of program managers' assessments with their permission. These things are intended to be confidential. Uh, and I published a volume about two years ago of about 25 of these assessments. And the reason I did that was to try to communicate to people uh, in think tanks and on the Hill and so on uh, more a sense of reality of what program management really is all about and what people are actually, what the problems people are fighting day to day. And there's a huge range of them. There, there are people who are fighting uh, how to sustain a system that's 30 years old that was bought as a commercial system in which there's no source of supplies for anymore. There are people that are out there trying uh, to, to generate a market where one doesn't exist to get more competition going, uh, to find creative ways to contract so they can open up things that have been in a single source environment for a long time to competition. 
Uh, there are people wrestling with very knotty technical problems and trying to figure out how to do risk mitigation of those technical problems. A huge range of things that, that people have to do. Um, and then I have a suggestion, I, I set an article which is a, a set of improvements that are offered by our program executive officers. I, I'm, my, my, as I sprint to the finish line and try to get through all of those program manager and program executive officer assessments that uh, I, I just had come in, uh, I, I did it to have them in place for my successor. I thought it would be a good body of work for him to be able to, he or she, to go through when they come in. But also wanted to respond to each of them. And what I find is that the program managers are very much eyes on their program, thinking about the very specific problems they're trying to solve. When you go up a notch and you have someone who's managing a portfolio of programs, they're much more aware of the policy issues that they have to deal with. And they have suggestions that have broader implication. So the next article in, the, in this section is from our program executive officers. And it's a, a number of uh, specific ways that we can improve gleaned from various program executive officers. I get a wide variety of things from them, and these all generate 100 action items at least, where I, I have people on the staff and people in the services go out and work to try to improve things. So that's next. Uh, and then I talk about the, the, uh, uh, the importance, again, in the environment that we live in, where rules-based solutions aren't really the answer. It's much more about professional judgment and our ability as professionals at the end of the day. The one thing that the Congress can do, and there has been some of this, we've worked with the Congress on this, is to make it easier for us to hire people, uh, make it easier for us to contemplate, uh, co compensate for them. Uh, we asked for something last year that we got which allows us to keep some of our 06 program managers who don't make it to 07, don't make it to Brigadier General or Rear Admiral, and would be forced out of the service when they're incredibly capable, at the peak of their capability of doing the kinds of job they're doing, and yet they have to leave. So we've got a provision in now which allows us to hang on to some of those people. There are a number of other things we're doing to improve recruiting and retention. The whole force of the future initiative Secretary Carter had is, is uh, along the same lines. Okay, turning to the next chapter on managing complexity. Uh, I start out with something called the very first article I wrote. Uh, five years ago was on the optimal program structure. And the point I was trying to get across is that there is no optimal program structure. Uh, we're very often, uh, by, by provisions from the Hill, put into a kind of a straitjacket. Uh, you will always do uh, competitive prototyping. You will always do open systems. It doesn't work. The, the spectrum of things that we have to do is too broad, uh, too diverse, and we need the flexibility in the department to do the right thing for whatever program it is we're doing. And what I tell people, and I have reinforced this over and over for years now, is that the first thing I want to know about a program is what is the product? What are you building? Because everything comes from that, form follows function. So now I don't start with 5002 and a, uh, the DOD instruction on acquisition and a specific set of milestones so that I then have to warp my program into fitting. I start the other way around. I start with the product and I think about, yeah, I get a fan here. I start with the product and I think about what's the most efficient way to develop this product? And everyone is unique. Everyone is unique in terms of the technology, the complexity, the urgency associated with it from the user, which defines, which, which, which uh, uh, has a lot to do with how much risk you're prepared to take uh, and how, many how much risk mitigation you're prepared to do to make sure you get to where you want to go. So there are a whole host of things you have to think about, but it all starts with what am I building? What is this thing that I'm going to try to create? And then you start looking at the various models and think about how you want to tailor them. I wrote myself, I personally wrote 5002, uh, the first half of it, which is all the different structures for programs and the process by which we approve programs. And I heavily edited the second half, which is all the specific topics about uh, different aspects of program management mostly. But basically the point I was trying to make in the front end was that there are a lot of different models you can start with whether you're software intensive or a business system or a traditional we complex weapon system or something else. But basically, uh, you tailor to the product that you're trying to develop. So that's fundamental uh, in, in doing uh, risk mitigation. The next article is on risk mitigation. And part of the, this section talks about an email uh, that I received from one of our program executive officers who was commenting on some events that were coming up in his program. And a couple of times he made the, the observation that, well, we'll wait and see what happens. And if something bad happens, then we'll have to do something about it. And I sort of had a little explosion. And I said, no, it's not our job to watch. It's our job to influence events. It's our job to think about 
what it is that we can do to lower that risk or to reduce the consequence of that risk if it materializes. And then to spend some money and do some things up front so we're in a better situation uh, to make sure that risk doesn't happen or to do something about it if it does. Uh, so I had a rather strong, and that led me to read, write an article about the subject, and uh, basically it was risk and risk mitigation, don't be a spectator. And I worked with Steve Welby, our chief engineer, uh, at the time to kind of rewrite our risk management uh, volume to make sure that was reflected there. The next article in here is uh, called The Trouble with TRLs. Any uh, Star Trek fans? Trouble with Tribbles? Okay. I'm dating myself. Uh, the, the Trouble with TRLs is similar to some of the other problems that I see where we let process control what we do. And TRLs, there's nothing wrong with TRLs except that they don't tell you very much about the actual risk you have to deal with. Uh, my, one of my uh, SAEs, Bill LaPlante, when he was with me, he told, he was in a meeting with me one day and he said that, you know, what we use TRL for is, uh, is it's, it's a way, it's a shorthand that we can use to communicate with management, but engineers never talk about them. Engineers talk about the technical problem and what you're going to have to do to solve the technical problem, because that's the heart of the matter. So TRLs are not a substitute for actually knowing what you're doing. But we tend to, again, like to use process as a way to uh, substitute for substance sometimes. And the trouble with TRLs is just that. Uh, getting from TRL 5 to 6 is a whole different thing for certain things than it is for other things. You have to know what you actually need to do and how hard it's going to be. Uh, and then I had a, an article on test and evaluation and the role of test and evaluation. In, uh, in, in development and acquisition, and how we need to work very tightly with system engineers and chief engineers and operational testers and developmental testers, testers both to have the most efficient program possible to get to the result that you're trying to achieve. And then I talked about manufacturing and technology for manufacturing in particular. Um, I've been very happy to be part of the uh, last several years opening a number of manufacturing innovation institutes. Uh, this is a pro program that the president started. It was designed uh, fundamentally to help the economy and to move our manufacturing technology forward and to benefit the national economy. It's also a huge benefit to the Defense Department because a lot of these technologies are applicable to the Defense Department. Uh, last week, I opened what I think is DOD's eighth manufacturing institute. It's on robotics for manufacturing. Uh, I talk about that importance and I go back and I relate some stories from the Cold War about how when we finally got our hands on Soviet equipment, what we found out was that their engineers were good, but their manufacturing technology really stank. And because of that, they couldn't build decent systems. They could conceive them, uh, they could do the theory, but they couldn't build them because they didn't have the manufacturing technology. So I highlight the importance of that in here. I also uh, talk about uh, innovation. And there has been a great deal of talk, obviously, about innovation in the last few years. We've emphasized it very heavily in the department. The uh, problem that I see with that is that we have, I, I'm afraid, can conveyed the impression unintentionally that lack of innovation is, is our problem and that more innovation is the solution to our problems. I don't believe that. I actually think we have quite a bit of innovation, uh, but what we haven't had is the money to take that innovation and translate it into products. So innovation involves a number of things, I comment on those, but at the end of the day, what you have to have to bring a product to market is not just an idea, but the capital to bring it to market, to develop it and then to start the manufacturing process. So I come in on that. And I think going forward, looking towards the next administration, uh, there may be more money falling into the Defense Department. I don't think that would be a bad thing, frankly. Um, but I hope that a lot of it goes to research and development and modernization, because that's where we really need the money. We've got the ideas. Uh, what we've been able to fund in the last few budgets is a number of demonstration projects, which are early stages risk reduction proof of principle projects. What we don't have in our budget right now, in our budget request, is the money to take those demonstrations and, assuming the results are successful, go on to building products, which is a whole different matter and much more expensive. So that's, that's a challenge, I think, for the next administration. Okay, the next chapter talks about working with industry. Uh, I, I have tried very, very hard for the last several years uh, to work closely with industry, to be open to communications with industry. I think it's absolutely the right thing to do. I found in the department a tendency to uh, be a, a, averse to having contact with industry, which I tried to push back on, I think was a certain amount of success. Spent a lot of time with the industry association, spent a lot of time with individual companies, CEOs of the major companies, certainly, but also some of the smaller companies, but to understand their perspective. And we've gone out to industry repeatedly and asked industry to give us ideas that we could implement in policy that would be win-wins for the government, for industry both. Um, I have been concerned about consolidation. The first piece in here is a, a, a piece I did 
uh, as a result of one of the merger and acquisition activity out there, where I was a little nervous about whether or not our rules uh, that are basically DOJ, Department of Justice rules, are adequate to address some of the problems I saw with the uh, longer term, at least, consolidation of defense industry. Uh, we've had a very consistent policy in this administration. It goes back to Secretary Carter in uh, about early 2011, I think, he gave a speech where he kind of laid out the principles for our acquisition, uh, our policy of relationship to the industrial base. And we've stuck with that. Now, it's not changed since, uh, since he did that. Uh, basically, we're not well disposed towards mergers at the top. I think, frankly, as a personal matter, that we probably did too much of that in the 90s. Uh, and now we're suffering a little bit for that. It's, it's overly consolidated in my mind. Uh, but we look at the marketplace uh, structuring deals below the top tier and look at them on a case-by-case -case basis. And we're very willing to intervene if we have the resources to do so and there's a priority to intervene to preserve parts of the industrial base. Every year in the budget process, including this year, we have set aside a meeting of the, uh, of the group that the Deputy Secretary chairs to look at the health of the industrial base. Um, as a result of that, the Justice Department and I put out a statement on uh, merger and acquisition activities and relationships, which is reflected in here. And I have an article which is, I think, a kind of a capstone article. It covers uh, all the various aspects of our relationship with industry and what our attitude towards industry should be. Uh, we're, we're in a business relationship. It's, uh, as I said earlier, defined largely by the contracts that we write. It should be a cordial, uh, friendly relationship but it should not be too intimate, okay? Uh, I do see cases, and I have over my career, where people have become, remember when I was, uh, I was in the Secretary of Defense's office in the 90s, and it was obvious to me in some cases that our program managers out there had a closer relationship uh, to their, their contractors than they did to the chain of command, which I did not think was a healthy situation. Uh, basically, when our program managers get in the business of being advocates, uh, helping industry, then they're, they've, they've not got, they haven't got the right attitude. We should be working with industry to get as much performance from industry as we can get. At the end of the day, they do the work, and how efficient they are depends upon uh, their relationship to us. Um, I do talk about fixed-priced incentive fee contracts in here and my views on fixed-price development. I'm in a running battle with part of the Congress about this, or I have been for years now. Um, I, uh, if you look at the statistics, it, it does not show much variation between uh, cost plus and fixed price in terms of what happens on contracts in terms of cost growth, which makes you ask some questions about what kind of fixed price contracts we're writing. But uh, that does not seem to be determiner of outcomes on our, on our, on our, on our work. Uh, and when you do development, uh, there's inherent risk. If we're, gonna, if we're gonna go beyond the state of the art by a decade, we're going to take risk. Industry only has so much capacity to absorb risk. Uh, once you have a fixed price contract, you do not have an industry the ability to walk away. If you do it, you're in court and we're going to have a big fight about it. Uh, in a commercial firm, you certainly do. If you're investing your own money to develop a product in your commercial firm, you're basically doing cost plus development because you're doing it yourself, you're paying for it, and as long as you see a business case, you continue, but as soon as you don't, you stop. And that's, that's a commercial practice, and that is cost plus. It is not fixed price. So the idea that fixed price is the solution to a lot of our problems, it was tried. It was tried and it failed. Uh, I, uh, one of my frustrations having been in this business so long is that we don't seem to learn from the past in many cases. But it was tried in the 80s. I spent a few years in the Pentagon in the late 80s and early 90s cleaning up the messes that fixed price development caused uh, across the department. It was a bad policy. Um, I talk about an article on commercial. There's another uh, school of thought that we should be more commercial. And in this article, I lay out the difference between uh, commercial practices and government practices as it applies to the things we do. Uh, and I, I highlight differences such as the fact that there is no such thing as a protest in the commercial world. There's no requirement for people to be fair to everybody in the commercial world. But the government does have that requirement, and for understandable reasons. Now, it is not the same. Uh, we also do not buy commercial products that we can expect industry to make investments in on their own, not for the most part. There are exceptions. And when we see exceptions, we should take advantage of them. Uh, I make that point in here also. Uh, but we are buying low volume, high cost, high capitalization products that we really can't reasonably expect the industry to just go develop on their own. So we pay for R&D. That's a fundamental difference between ourselves and commercial industry. Uh, the next one is about incentives. The next article in here is about incentives and how we try profit to results. And we've looked at the data on that. We've studied that very carefully. Uh, we discovered that for the most part, we we're doing reasonably well. But in some cases, we were, we were not having any effect. In some cases, we we're having the opposite of the desired effect. So I think we've corrected course on that in that sense. And this talks about 
some of the things we can do uh, to provide strong incentives to industry to get better performance without putting unreasonable risk on industry at the same time. Uh, and then the next article, and the last one, is about getting best value. And this is a change we've made just the last few years, done it with the cooperation of the requirements communities, where basically we define in monetary terms how much more we're willing to pay for higher performance. So industry now has a financial incentive to offer us higher performance. If we didn't have that, everybody, and this has been the tradition since the end of the Cold War, everybody defaults to the threshold levels of performance, or to the minimum that we want. Uh, we actually would like to do better than the minimum when we, when we can, when we can get a reasonable cost for that. Uh, my next uh, chapter is on responding to external forces, and I start with the Congress, and I include a letter that I sent to Senator McCain uh, and Senator Levin. They asked for input from a wide variety of people, most of whom, by the way, were not acquisition people, about what to do to fix acquisition, and I include uh, my letter in here. It covers things like, uh, that are, I think, uh, maybe fantasies, frankly, but I think would be desirable, such as a margin account. In a, in a business, you set aside, you have a margin account if you're doing an investment in a new product, because you anticipate, it's, it's normal for products to overrun in development. It's not unusual. Uh, you don't know the things that you don't know when you set out, and problems are going to arise. That's understood. So you have some margin in your program to account for that. Uh, I would like to do that at a level above the individual program in DOD and there are different ways you could structure this, but that was one of the things that I asked for. I also asked for fewer rules. <laughs> um, I, there's a fantasy also, I guess. Uh, but anyway, the rest of the things that are in there that, uh, that I, that I uh, suggested could be done by the Congress to try to improve outcomes for us. Um, there is a memo in here which I wrote with initially Bob Hill, the financial undersecretary for uh, Comptroller Financial Management, and then later with Mike McCord, his successor about this perverse incentive of your job is to get the money out the door. That you, you're, you know, in the government, you're, spo you're, you're supposed to spend the money, that's your job. Our job is to get the best value for the taxpayer. And if that takes a little longer, that's what we should be doing. So Mike and I, uh, Bob first, and then Mike and I both put things out to the workforce. We set up reviews to try to get that balance correct. We should be, we should be managing our cash flow. We should not be asking for money from the Congress that we don't intend to spend. But on the other hand, if taking a little more time is going to get us a much better business deal, that's what we should do. Or if circumstances intervene, we shouldn't be just spending money just because we have it. Uh, I, I don't, I think I mentioned this later on in one other article that I'll mention in a minute, but I gave a speech years ago, one of the first speeches I gave, it was at CSIS, Andrew, and David Berteau is in the back, I think you may have something to do with that one. Um, and I talked about acquisition malpractice. And the example I gave of acquisition malpractice was the F-35 decision to start production when we hadn't done a flight test yet. Um, no engineer in his right mind would do that. Uh, why did we do it? Because we had the money. Because the money was sitting there in the budget. You know, the schedule for development had slipped, but we had the money sitting in the budget. We didn't want to, quote, waste the money. So we, we started production before we had a stable design. It was a bad decision. Uh, but it was driven by these external factors that, that tend to impose on us. Um, when we implemented sequestration, I put out a one-page email which is included to the workforce about how to conduct ourselves during sequestration, which basically reinforced that our job is always to get the best value for the taxpayer. And we're not going to make sequestration look worse. We're going to do the best we can uh, with the resources that we have. And I think that, that guidance, I think, was very helpful to people in the workforce. I think it's what people have followed. Uh, and then I have some articles that discuss uh, the circumstances we find ourselves in with regard to uh, changes both in a budget environment, uh, changes in terms of direction from the Hill and various other things, and how we react to those, and uh, guidance to the workforce basically in those areas. Um, <clears throat> I talk about, this is a long chapter, responding to external forces because there are a lot of external forces, but one of them is threats. And I have been concerned for ever since I came into office uh, several years ago about the erosion of our technological superiority. And I talked specifically about that and what we were doing in Better Buying Power 3.0, which very specifically addressed that problem and there's a number of things that we could do to do that. Uh, and I talk about sustaining momentum. My, my theme for this past year uh, were twofold. One was sustain momentum because the data was showing that what we're doing is working. And the other theme was keep your sense of humor. I'm working on the second one still. But anyway, uh, there is a lot of momentum right now. And as I read all of these program executive officer and program manager assessments of their programs, I am hearing back the things that I want to hear. Some of that is the lip service that managers always get when they have a program with a name like Better Buying Power. But a lot of it is genuine. A lot of it is 
uh, success stories about how people have implemented should cost, or they've implemented a better set of incentives with their contractor, or they've gotten competition where they've been sole sourced for 10 years, and now they're going to do competition. Uh, so we have achieved a lot, I think, in the last several years. And I think it's important that that momentum be sustained going forward. Uh, the next thing in here is a letter to the service secretary. It's several pages long. It's a lot of detail. I sat down with uh, General Goldfein this morning from the Air Force, and he, wanted to, he walked through it with me in, in detail. I, I provided it uh, for the general public and for our workforce. And it talks about the chief's role and the things, first of all, that the chiefs can do to help, and there are a lot of them. Uh, you can help with requirements, because our requirements process is a bit too rigid and too bureaucratic. Uh, it needs to be more flexible and more agile. I talked about budgets and making sure we budget adequately for the things that we try to do. And I talked about people and the things that service chiefs can do because they run the personnel system basically to uh, attract more people uh, and retain them so that we have the quality workforce that we need for success. Acquisition embodies about a dozen different professions, but the key ones include program management, engineering, contracting, testing, uh, and a few others. Those disciplines need to be strong in the department if we're going to be successful. And I get feedback that reinforces that every day from our program managers. Um, I also talk about the things they can do that could be problematic. And I've had a lot of experience with chiefs or service leadership asking for unrealistic things uh, and having military organizations being what they are. If a four-star tells you to do something, you're likely to say, yes, sir. And if a four-star tells you to have a completely unrealistic schedule, which is not that infrequent, uh, people will say yes, sir, and they will go try, knowing that there is almost no chance whatsoever of success. I lived a couple of programs that were like that. Uh, it was very painful, very expensive experience. I don't want to see that repeated. And then I talked, the last article in here is another trend that I'm seeing now that I'm a little nervous about, which is the trend towards something called rapid acquisition. There's this idea that there's that old kind of acquisition over there, and that there's this new kind of acquisition called rapid acquisition over here, that we're just going to do this kind now. Um, rapid acquisition means high risk, low quality acquisition. And I wrote a piece in response to a conversation I had with General Milley uh, where he was asking me about going faster. And I said, you need to understand that the cost of speed is quality. If you want, uh, and we have made a mistake in this area, and sometimes we've done the right thing. If, if urgency is really the driving factor and you absolutely have to have something quickly because people are dying because you're in combat, then Cutting aside all the other stuff that's sort of good to have but not essential and getting to the thing that matters is the right thing to do. And my example of that is MRAPs. We built MRAPs, uh, relatively simple design, existing automotive components put together with a lot of armor. Uh, and interestingly, the first batch of MRAPs we bought, which we bought 10 to thousands of, uh, and deployed primarily in Iraq, were not well suited for the terrain in Afghanistan. And when we got to Afghanistan, we had to do the MRAP ATVs so that we'd have a more dynamic suspension, smaller vehicle that was appropriate for that terrain. So we bought another few thousand vehicles like that. Uh, I'll contrast both of those programs with JLTV, which is a longer, more traditional program where we thought very, very carefully about the requirements. We did a really strong competition. We took our time to get prototypes and do testing and then awarded a best value contract that rewarded people for giving us the features that we wanted. So what are some of those features that you would sacrifice when you're in a hurry? Cybersecurity, reliability, maintainability, uh, some of the cost driving features and manufacturability. Uh, there's a long, long list of things. The ability to work in all climates and all terrains. Those are things that our operators want, uh, but they take more time and they take more detailed designs and they take more testing. So that's sort of the normal acquisition process that gets you that quality vehicle. Uh, the rapid acquisition process tends to get you something that is not very reliable, but it may do some things you really care about. Now, what we've done in the past, and Global Hawk is an example of this, is we've we bought products that we did technology demonstrators of, liked the features of those demonstrators, and then just bought more of them. Uh, Global Hawk is an example of that. The uh, kill vehicles that are defending North America today is another example. And what happens when you do that is you then wake up and realize that you've got a very unreliable system that you've got to go back and fix. In the case of Global Hawk, we almost canceled the program. The sustainment costs were so astronomical that it was determined uh, that it was better to keep the, the U-2, the 1950s generation airplane, for another few decades and scrap Global Hawk. It was too expensive to sustain. Well, Northrop Grumman understood that it had a problem. It was going to lose that market, and it got to work, and it reduced the uh, sustainment cost dramatically. So come fast forward a year or two, which I, which I thought was doable at the time, so I was on the right side of that argument ultimately. 
Uh, fast forward a year or so, and systemic costs are down. Uh, the contractor demonstrated he could do it. We got a better design, and then we changed our minds and decided to keep Global Hawk and, and to retire the U-2, which I think was the right decision at the end of the day. But that was the process we had to go through to get there, and we almost didn't, it almost didn't happen. Uh, so anyway, the bottom line of all that is there are times when you want to do rapid acquisition, that there are really good reasons to do it. But it is not uh, a panacea, and it is not the thing that you could expect uh, to solve all of our problems. You're not going to get the same quality product if you go down that route. Uh, and, you're gonna, and you can expect uh, bad things to happen, risks to materialize, and overruns and schedule slips to occur. But if, if time is the thing that motivates you, and only key operational parameters that are really essential uh, is the only thing that may motivates you, then that's fine. It's the right thing to do. MRAPs were the right thing to do, no, no question about it. Okay, the last section uh, uh, in here, I talk about uh, measuring progress. And I talk about, next to last, talk about measuring progress. And I provide some of the results that have come out of the analysis we've done over the last few years. Uh, and I, and I, I provide the forward to the annual report and provide links to the annual reports that are provided. And I won't dwell on that. Uh, we are at a 30-year low. Uh, for the five-year moving average of cost growth on our most risky programs. Uh, that's a major accomplishment. And I credit all those thousands of people out there who are now in, more empowered than they were before to do the right thing, to, to, to write contracts that protect the government's rights a little bit better, that provide better incentives to industry, uh, for getting should cost targets and going out and trying to achieve them. Now, all those things right across all those programs is what's produced that result. The last thing in the, uh, in the volume is uh, an article I just published. It's called Adventures in Defense Acquisition. Uh, that may be a little bit of overstatement, uh, but it's a, it's a series of anecdotes from my life for the last 30 or 40 years that uh, I, I think may have some instructive value, if you will. But they're the experiences that, that taught me a lot about this business and what works and what doesn't. So you know, I provide a number of them, and I try to do it while protecting the innocent as much as I could. Okay, that's it. I'm gonna stop there, Andrew, and we'll do some questions. <clears throat> Thank you, Frank, and thank you for making my job easy by uh, taking us almost to the end of our time. But we are not at the end of time. We have a little bit of time left, and I want to get to questions. And I had a, a few. I, I, I'm accused all the time of being passionate. Uh, <laughs> this, this word kept coming up, and people talking to me. You know, I appreciate your passion. And I thought, God, I think that means I'm a hot-headed loudmouth. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> I do get uh, into it when I start talking about this. Stuff. Well, I, I think uh, this is a topic where passion is appropriate. Uh, being, uh... you guys are about to drag my mic off. Aren't you? <laughs> okay, um, I think passion is appropriate when you're dealing with uh, billions of dollars. Uh, oh. In some cases, trillions of dollars and, and lives. Uh, point well taken. I'm going to go straight to questions uh, from the audience. We have. I'm going to broaden the first one a little bit, kind of cheat and get one of mine in. Uh, but uh, for those who are out there, we're going to we're going to recognize folks. We also have some cards that were distributed, so a couple of questions have already been brought forward that way, and we're still uh, welcoming those uh, during the time we have left. The first question uh, kind of relates to this performance metric question, and I think in. Um, it's certainly there in the latest of your defense uh, performance, the defense acquisition reports may have been in earlier versions where you mentioned that, you know, a real measure of value in the defense acquisition system is, uh, is not always evident or, or may not exist. We have, we have metrics, cost growth, number of curdy, breaches, other things, but they don't necessarily get at fundamental value. Uh, and so the question is, uh, is there something we could be doing to develop that metric? Or do the metrics we have uh, need to change, or are they good for what they actually do, even if it's not everything? Uh, and then the question that I kind of have modified here specifically related to operational test and the value of that, uh, particularly in an era where, uh, where we're trying to recover technological superiority. Okay, metrics and OT. Um, the obvious metrics are the easy things to measure, right? Cost and schedule performance. And also, did you get the product that you set out to get? Um, so we do a lot of that. Um, I basically regard, I don't regard it as a failure if a program has a 10 or 20 percent uh, overrun in R&D, if I get the product that I wanted at the end of that at a reasonable price. Um, uh, 
we often compare ourselves to our plans, right? So is our, is our plan price what we actually get in production, for example? I think these are all valid things to do because they, they reflect the accuracy of our planning. So uh, if you plan accurately, you don't have as much disruption. Uh, your, your, your customers can be more uh, uh, confident that you're gonna deliver what you say you're gonna deliver on time and, and on schedule. I think we're a bit unrealistic about our expectations for, de and, uh, expectations for development costs. I don't think we should regard it as a, a, a travesty if you have a 10 or 20% overrun in development. I think that's actually a success. And I wouldn't want to set our goals uh, so that we never had overruns in development. I think that would lead to a lot of wasted money, frankly, because I want to keep pressure on people to perform. But the metric that matters at the end of the day is are we going to win? Um, I was at a, DARPA had a, a kind of a, a technology conference in St. Louis a couple of years ago I went to. And, I was with Arthi Prabhakar, the director of DARPA, and we were having lunch and she said, okay, you got another hour or so here. What would you like to see? And I looked at her and I said, I want to see the things that are going to most improve the combat capability of the United States. That's my metric. And I, I actually think we should think more about that than we do, uh, particularly given that uh, we're being challenged today uh, for technological superiority. The, uh, uh, I was in a meeting recently talking about a weapon system where CAPE had done a trade-off on uh, how to kind of optimize the mix of things we would buy. And it was sort of a cutting edge system being competed against a kind of a legacy system. And they were, you know, using our scenarios kind of as the basis for their analysis, trying to optimize the mix of cost. And I said, I said, you have got this completely wrong that the metric you should be looking at is which purchases are gonna maximize the combat capability of the United States for whatever we have to do in the world and whatever deterrence mission we might have. So I, I, I think, Frank, one of the things that I'd like to see us do, and I, tr I did try to do this, I made some progress on it, but I think we, there's more to be done, is to bring back some of the operations research systems analysis kind of expertise that was standardized in the Cold War that we had a lot of. We didn't make a move. We didn't make a decision about a requirement or a new system without having run a lot of analysis to determine that it was gonna make a difference on the battlefield. So I'd like to see a return to that kind of a metric uh, as, as a, more, a more fundamental driver on what we do. We're, we're doing an awful lot of requirements decisions, in my view, kind of on the seat of our pants. And I, I think we can do better than that. OT. Um, OT has value. Uh, it, it, I was in the Army, I think, in the 70s when the whole OT thing got started. It came out of some uh, failures, if you will, where we've discovered some of the things we're building really were very unsuitable. Uh, in, in some ways, it could have been devastating for, 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 for soldiers. <clears throat> and so I think doing a kind of a graduation test in our weapon systems to ensure that in a realistic environment, they're gonna perform uh, basically as we would intend is a good thing to do. Um, I think OT has gotten overly, it, it's gone in different directions under different leadership. Um, it became very rigid for a long time about exact requirements and meeting requirements. And that was the definition of success. I think what we've done more recently, which is, okay, I'm gonna put you in a realistic environment and see how you do. And if you don't do well, that's, that's not good. Whatever your requirement was, the fact that you met your technical requirement isn't the definition of success. And I actually think that that's the right thing to do. Um, I think we, we should be doing, I, we have better integrated OT and DT, so that we're doing operational assessments now. I, I applaud them. Uh, uh, I think they give us information early on about the effectiveness of our weapon systems and allow us to make design changes when it's much more efficient to do so. So overall, I'm a supporter of, of OT. Um, I, I, uh, I think there needs to be a more collaborative relationship than there has been. OT has a certain degree of independence. I think that independence personally has been overemphasized the last few years. And it needs to be a little more collaborative uh, relationship than it has been. All right, next one's an easy one. Um, you talked about uh, wanting to put people in charge of things when they have the right expertise and experience to do it, and the specifically program managers. Well, one thing that's on the mind of our audience is the next uh, occupant of the a l office. Uh, and uh, I'm gonna assert the rebuttable uh, presumption that that office is, nature is gonna change as a result of the statutory changes. You can, you can maybe persuade me that it won't change as much as we might think, but uh, you know, so what is the skill set to bring to that job and the, and, the, and the nature that it's going to take on in the next administration with the new statute? Yeah, I, I've lived most of the uh, undersecretary experience one way or the other since 1986. I came to the Pentagon in 86 
uh, to be a deputy assistant undersecretary, I think, or something like that, for strategic defense systems. It was about the time SDI, Strategic Defense Initiative, was going on. And I worked for the last undersecretary for research and engineering named Don Hicks. Um, and then we transitioned to the undersecretary for acquisition. And that position has evolved. Acquisition became acquisition technology, and then it became acquisition technology logistics. But the job didn't fundamentally change. It was the person who was in charge of the total life cycle of our programs, which I think is frankly the right model. The, uh, uh, and I've talked to Bill Perry, who is one of our most famous uh, and, and, and uh, prestigious directors of defense research and engineering. And he has said that when he was in that position, he was all about technology. He wasn't thinking about life cycle cost. He wasn't thinking about the business deals he was, he was getting. And he, he thinks we should have had a balance that brought more of that in. Uh, I'm not sure how it's going to work out with uh, what's in the law now. Uh, I'll be watching and <laughs> I'll be interested. Uh, and I can see it going in a good way or a bad way, depending upon how we do it. I think there is a less bad way to do it. I don't think it's a good thing. I'll be clear about that. I do not think the breakup is a good thing. It's a bad thing. We should keep all that together. One of the things I've worked on very hard in the last few years is to have my acquisition assistant secretary and my research and engineering assistant secretary work very closely together uh, and to focus on the transition of technology into products. So if I separate products from research, it's going to be harder to make that happen. I've got that up at a higher level now. Um, so I'm, I'm not in favor of what we're doing there. What scares me more than that is that we'll bring in outsiders who have no idea how uh, this place, how the Pentagon works. They will have no idea how the defense industry works. And I've seen that, okay? With the first few undersecretaries for acquisition, uh, not all, uh, first two or three of the first few, were people from non-defense industry. The idea was we're going to bring professional managers in. And they're going to bring commercial industry expertise in. And I'm a little nervous that that may happen in this administration. Uh, those people stayed about a year average. And about the end of the year, they started to understand the jungle they were living in. Uh, and I've got a couple people in the room who shared some of that experience with me. And they weren't bad people. They were good people. They were good managers. They, were, they had, had good experience in doing what they had done before. But it wasn't what we do. And, you know, it was a bit like saying that a surgeon's a surgeon. I just need a good... You know, if I'm doing brain surgery and I hire somebody as an internist, for example, uh, because I just want some general, you know, it, it, it doesn't work. You have to understand what you're doing. You also have to understand the cultures. I mean, DOD brings with it some very interesting cultural things, and so does this town. So bringing somebody in who does not have the experience to work in that environment, I think, is, is a disservice. Uh, they will spend their first year just learning what the environment is like and how it works before they can be effective. And I, I used to refer to my job in the Pentagon. I had eight undersecretaries in eight years. And I refer to my job as training political appointees. Um, some of them needed more training than others. All right, we are, again, coming to close to the end of our time. So I apologize to all those who submitted questions. I'm not going to be able to get to all of them. But uh, you made reference to the third offset strategy uh, and the Defense Innovation Initiative. Uh, I think the way to cap this off maybe is to just ask you about the, the key areas uh, that you think uh, we should be, you know, we the policy community here uh, among us, industry here as well, uh, should be focused on in the range of technologies uh, that we need to keep top of mind. I know there's, it's an endless list, but the, the things that really need to be at the top. Um, there, are there are technologies that are moving forward in the commercial world very rapidly that are going to have very significant military implications. Uh, big data is one, autonomy is another, artificial intelligence is another. And I would say biological technologies may be on that list as well. And they're going to go quickly, and uh, they're going to be driven by commercial investments. And they're going to be global. Uh, the, the third offset strategy was a recognition that the way of fighting in the set of capabilities that we introduced in 1991 and have, and have had advanced since then, certainly quite a bit, but we introduced in 1991 that our potential adversaries have had a lot of time to try to figure out what to do about that. And they have acted on that. And so uh, for the two uh, near peer or peer competitors we have in the world, you know, that's a problem for us. So we need to have something that moves us a step forward. It gives us a step functioning improvement. And uh, what we have come out of the third officer strategy work is a series of demonstrations that we funded. Uh, the Deputy Secretary has really emphasized the artificial intelligence and autonomy aspects of that. That is clearly going to be a piece of whatever comes next. 
so I think we have those as focus areas, and that's important, and we're doing a lot of experimentation. But for me, we do not yet have the clear uh, design concept, if you will, for a new suite of capabilities that will be dramatically better on the battlefield. When I, I used to run the follow-on forces attack suite of things. And that was a suite of capabilities which had a clear efficiency improvement for warfare. Basically, you're going to use one shot, one kill. Uh, and that was going to be a dramatic change in logistics requirements. It was going to be a dramatic change in also our ability to extend beyond a line of contact uh, and to do precision kills. That's still what we basically depend upon. I don't have as clear a picture in my mind of where we're going. I've asked for people to do some studies uh, of where we might go with autonomous systems. Autonomous systems have the virtue of not having people in them that might die, which is good. Uh, in some cases, you can get better performance out of them. You can pull more Gs in an aircraft, for example. Um, and you might get some cost out, but you gotta be, look, if you, if you take the example of a fighter plane and you try to make an autonomous fighter plane, you take the person out, you save about 1,000 pounds on, a, say, a 35,000 pound airplane. That's not a big, that's not a game changer. So before you do it, you gotta think about it. I was looking at the new bomber recently, which has, I can't say much about that because it's classified. Uh, it is not a big step at all to make that bomber autonomous versus man, if we want to do that. But what do you get? It, it's even less of a trade-off. Now, if you're willing to sacrifice the platform and you take the person out, now you're much more willing to have a higher attrition rate. But if you're spending $100 million on a platform, you don't want to have a very high attrition rate. So, you know, you've got to think about that too. Cost matters also, not just human lives, but also uh, cost in dollars. So we, we're, I, I think there's still a good deal of work to be done uh, in, in determining where our competitive advantage might be. Uh, I think some of the technologies that the Deputy Secretary is emphasizing are very much a part of that equation. But I'm, I don't know that we, we have a clear set of goals in mind and an operational concept kind of a, a conceptual design, if you will, that we can then go build and say, here's our advantage. I think it's a much more competitive environment because we don't have uh, the science and technology advantage that we had back in the 70s and 80s. Well, thank you, Frank. Uh, you know, I, I originally, of course, always was these events come prepared with a question or two, you know, pre-written and, and, and I, I, I ditch, I almost always ditch them because they get answered. And, and one of the questions I was going to ask you is about your message to the acquisition workforce. And as I listened to you talk, I thought, well, you've got 300 pages of message here. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I forbear asking that question because, uh, because you just told it to us. So I want to thank you for doing that. I want to thank you for many years of coming, uh, well, I should say, going out to the public, talking about what you're doing. We love it, obviously, when you've done it here at CSIS. Uh, and so I just wanted to say thanks. Thank you, Ed. It's been a pleasure. <laughs>